Welcome, everybody, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the um, Graduate Center at CUNY, the City University um, of New York in Manhattan, in New York, where um, somehow uh, uh, the city is trying to get back to life to the uh, opening bars and restaurants and uh, partly work uh, is restarting. Um, it's a uh, uh, week 12 of our series. Every day we talk uh, for, uh, from artists around the world. And, um, and today we have with us a, a, in Japan, he would be called a, a living legend, uh, one of the great, great makers of theater and the history of theater, Peter Schumann from the Bread and uh, Puppet Theater uh, with us. Um, but it's going to be also a wonderful week. We're going to have Govan Ruben and Terence Conrad from Malaysia with us from the Terry and the Groose Company, the really significant and important political activist and installation artist, Tanya Bruguera from Cuba, uh, is taking time uh, out of her work to talk from, uh, for us. Hope Azeda from Rwanda will uh, join us on Thursday. She did many of the reconciliation uh, performances and uh, she will tell us the situation for theater artists in Rwanda. And then Saman Amini, an Iraqi, an Iranian refugee who at the age of 11 left his country with his family, came to the Netherlands, somehow got into an acting stool, does theater there. Will tell us about the situation of theater artists um, in the Netherlands. So this will be a truly an interesting and I think important week and, and what a start we have. The world is uh, of course still confusing. Um, Iran just said it went up within a couple of weeks to 200,000 infections. The medical community is coming together. We have a 161 vaccinations uh, in testing, 242 remedies, 700 different tests. Everybody tries to work together. Uh, in Beijing, uh, uh, the neighborhood has been closed again. The Haidan neighborhood is not good news um, for, for everybody. It looks like uh, it cannot be fully contained. Paris opened like New York, the restaurants and cafes, but um, as here in New York, there are big concerns and there might take back the reopening if the crowds really don't behave. Um, only 1% of population has the uh, immunity at the moment to have that what they call herd immunity. We would need 70%. So we are far, far, um, far away. And what happens and how fast this can spread out is Brazil. Uh, when we talked to our Brazilian colleagues, there were like two, 300,000 cases. Now they are close to a million cases. They're still behind us. The most devastated country at the moment is the United States. Of course, it's a big country and testing is more, but still things haven't been turned right. And now let's uh, have a look at the great, great work of uh, Peter Schumann. So I'm gonna read and rest a little bit so we know um, um, uh, a bit about the history. Um, and also we wanna thank, thank Elke Schumann, his wife, he, maybe we saw her, I'm not sure she came in, uh, with whom he uh, created that politically radical puppet theater in 1962. Mm -hmm. Peter has been a uh, 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 legend for his work as a Vietnam War pr protest. Uh, his politically themed social commentary uh, uh, theater is of significance in the American theater history. And he invented kind of a radical street theater that uh, is being followed by, by thousands uh, and companies around the world and watched by, by so many. At the moment he is in Vermont with, the, uh, with his uh, company um, where he creates his outdoor festivals for a long time. He ran the domestic resurrection circus, a very big extravaganza. He participated for a long time in the Halloween parade, was in trouble when he said, I'm not gonna support the, um, uh, the Afghan war. Uh, um, when he said, we wanna be critical of it, we think of the people and he refused to uh, participate. His New York home is the theater for the new city where he shows his work regularly if it's open. He has been known for his opposition and plays against the World Trade Organization, uh, against the Vermont nuclear power plant he supported the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, the Zapatista movement. Uh, in the year 2000, some members of his company got arrested uh, at the National uh, Republican National Convention where they were building theater in a workshop and they thought it was a terrorist Sorry, plot. You. There's a big law case against him, I think, uh, on the on when he was performing in the St. Patrick's Cathedral and they were wearing uh, in the 60s masks and painted their faces and policemen said they should stop that, that's not allowed. There's a big 
a case they ultimately won and their, their characters they created, Uncle Fatso, the washerwoman, uh, the white Latina and, and the many armed mother, um, a, a legend, um, Julie Tamer quoted them in her film work around the universe. And um, so um, this is a long and big introduction. So uh, Peter, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time. Um, uh, to come with me. He was always born the same year as my father in Silesia in Germany. He ended up uh, here in, um, in New York as an artist. Peter, where are you at this moment and uh, how do you feel? I am in my daughter's house, which is one hillside east from our house. We are on the next hillside. We are sitting up here looking into that beautiful it's called the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. So we are in the Northeast Kingdom. We don't know where the king is. We are still looking. But it might uh, be you. It. it might yeah. be you. <laughs> no, no. No. What's but that behind it, you? That is from uh, what we call a bad bed sheet philosophy painting. Because a friend of mine bought me a whole truckload full of a discarded bed sheets from a big hotel, outside a big hotel, and dumped them into our workshop. And I feel free to paint as much as I want. It's wonderful to know that I'm painting on surfaces that had so many uses. So, and they, some of them are ripped, not so great. And when I hang them out in the wind, they may rip a little more, but they're terrific. So this is a bad bedsheet philosophy painting. Here you see, my God, it looks pretty apocalyptic, doesn't yes. it? Yes. All kind of fires. Well, that's because our life is that way. Those fires are coming closer and closer. And as you all experience this big thing with the virus coming on us, our civilization tries to redefine is its essentials. But we are puppeteers, so we know very well we are non-essentialists. The fingernail polishers are already declared that they are essential, the tattoo artists are essential, but we are puppeteers, so we know we are non-essentialists. So we can talk from the standpoint of non-essentialism. And this time is quite difficult here on our farm on which we do gardening in addition to theater to feed our team. But the team isn't there. We normally at this time of year, we are about between 75, 100 people on the farm. And right now we are eight people on the farm. The tour, that traveled in the springtime with 25 people throughout the states was interrupted when the virus came about. They lost all their engagements and they had to come home. People who could still go home went home. And these are the eight stranded people who ended up here. And that's our new company. Hmm. We are doing shows. Uh, out on the farm in the pine forest. And we call them combined insurrection and resurrection services. And unfortunately, we can only have 10, first 10 for the first few. Now we are allowed 25 people oh, to come. And by mid July, we want to get enough neighbors involved so that we can do what we usually do in the summer, circuses. We have a big old gravel pit, that's our amphitheater, that can, where we in the 90s had like 20, 30,000 people seeing the circuses. So that's big enough that we could have many groups of 25 people seeing the circus. So that's our aim this summer, to see if we can get enough performers and neighbors together to do that again. 
That's where we go, yeah. But I mean, the arts are in general in trouble. You mentioned the Iraq war. And I won't ever forget that, how the Iraq war was started by the United States assigning finally an essential task to the arts. They couldn't find any documentation on weapons of mass destruction. So they found good artists who could fake it and made fake little pictures of tunnels and trucks and all that. And that's how they persuaded the whole goddamn Western world to go into those horrendous war in which millions of people got displaced and murdered and what have you. With the help of the arts, imagine. Mm. So the arts are a political power, finally. Unfortunately, in the wrong direction. So that's our situation. And we live in the midst of this, yeah. So our little services in the pine forest, yeah, it's about an hour long. People come and sit at distances from each other. We have a garbage man with the yardstick going around and measuring their distances off and on that they don't wiggle away from the positions. And when we sing, we try to sing, or even when we shout, we try to do that in off directions that it doesn't go directly to our audience. So we are practicing a new art form with this distancing. Mm -hmm. And it's very few people, but that doesn't make any difference to us. Mm -hmm. We traditionally do village parades in the summertime here in Vermont, up in the in north and east of here in little towns. And often enough, there are way more trees there as spectators than people. <laughs> There's about 25 people there and about 100,000 trees. 100, so we are used to that. But that's still, that's a big difference. 20 or 30,000 people who once also came to this, this circus and now you're down to this. So you put it out on the internet and people can register and pay a ticket. That's, that's the next step. We haven't done it yet. Right now we do everything by calling people up. Calling people up. the puppeteers mm -hmm. are going to change this. They're going to make it with internet. Yeah. And and how do you run with seven people, uh, your, the entire farm or eight? That's, is that- Yeah, even, that's a- we, that's we, we create sounds create impossible. a big mess. Yeah, yeah, we have a garden. A bit of time has to be spent in the garden. Rehearsals are very short, so our shows are as bad as ever. But the people that we have happen to be great, versatile performers. So they are musicians, they are dancers, they are shouters, they are narrators, and they can manipulate the puppets and the masks we have. And what's done doesn't compare to these huge pageants that float over the fields. But we are starting to mechanize some of these big uh, mass movements of a herd of caribou coming out of the woods and make that into mechanical pulling things that mm -hmm. very few mm -hmm. people can do. Incredible, as someone said, one. One can do everything in life, but not at the same time. And when you do a big show for thousands, you cannot do a small one. And then you have to do a small one. You can't <laughs> do one for the big ones. But Peter, what do you think of the times we live in? You have this Dante-esque uh, inferno behind you. Then you perform in the pine forest. I think Dante said that terrestrial paradise is in the pine forest close to the to the uh, ocean, of course, where he was in Ravenna. But so you are between the pine forest and the and the hell. But what do you think? What do you make of this time? What we where we are in now? Well, it's a great task for us who want to address the problems of the time to the public large to reinvent 
outlet and to find the really meaningful things and the meaningful ways of saying them to our audiences. And whether that's a little audience or a big one is almost secondary to the fact that it has to be reinvented because the lost normality that is being deplored wasn't so great and is rather deplorable when you take a closer look at it. So whatever normality comes back to us can't be that old decrepit normality. There must be a better one that learns from the insights that through this situation we gain by looking at our normality, which is so proudly trying to come back upon us. It shouldn't and it won't. Yep, that's yeah. the situation. You said, uh... We have to do it in a meaningful, essential way, in a way that works. What what way works? What do you think? How do we have to do theater now? Well, the littleness of things that wanted to be big has to be considered. The absence of uh, the, the means, the normal means that are available uh, seem to have changed. So for us, I mean, it's different for you in the city, but for us in the countryside, it means, for example, we can't do simultaneous theater. We are not enough to have four stages going at the same time and such things. But it's also an opportunity to, because of the restriction, to invent exactly those forms that are possible with the restrictions. So yeah, for us, it looks like we just want to work on it, figure out how to do it. I think the same is true of language. You know, the, the normal address, the political speech, the, 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 the sort of uh, interpretation of the moment in time, the horror of capitalism upon the world, the seeing of that and the saying of that, the concentration of getting the words to be clearer, to be fewer, to be right into the brain of people and not just into their taste buds or into that which they are used to. It's another uh, thing that you owe to a extremely difficult situation. I'm a war kid, you know, I grew up in uh, Nazi Germany in the war with the bombs falling and the horrors of that regime restricting family life to whispering and what have you. And then became a refugee at the end of the war. And that fleeing from burning buildings, the fleeing from an area that was under attack to the countryside, then learning in the countryside how to live on the things that you glean from the fields because you don't own the fields and the crop and from the berries that you pick and the mushrooms that you learn to eat. That is, uh, that was my basic education. I was 10 years at the time and I think that whatever I learned in life is all from that time. I also did my first puppet show that time. Because when we fled Silesia, my parents, we are five kids in the family. My parents allowed each kid to take a little bag of their own. And I took a bag of hand puppets that we had. My parents were friends with puppeteers and for Christmas, we usually got a hand puppet. And so our home entertainment when I was a kid was to put a bed sheet between two chairs and then pick up the Caspar and the devil and the, and the Omar and the, and the robber and then you make up a puppet show. So that was what we did for each other for our birthdays and so on. And when we 
where in that village in on the Baltic, in northern Germany, uh, I asked my brother to help me in thing for the village population. We knocked at the door and said, hey, there's a puppet show over there, and we did that kind of a show. First public show, yeah. What uh, was the first public show? What was it about? What was the theme? Oh, that's the best part of it all. There wasn't any what was it about. Because the puppets themselves tell the story. There's a robber, there's a ghost, there's death, there's Caspar who solves all problems, there's his grandma who always knits, there is, uh, you know, it's all given. You, it's all given. You don't have to invent it. Mm -hmm. It's there. Yeah. So, Peter, you saw uh, burning cities, bombs falling in World War II. How serious is the situation we are in now? Well, it's unfortunately way more serious than just the virus because the boss of the world, Mr. Trump, before the virus came, decided to arm a trident nuclear, uh, a trident uh, with a nuclear weapon and uh, ordered it to sail. And I believe it's now still in the Mediterranean, but it's going towards the Gulf. And I think that this is an unacceptably dangerous situation to have an idiot on the trigger of a, of a destruction weapon that can wipe out the world because it will have chain reactions. So uh, it's unbelievably dangerous and it's not paid attention to. I don't understand why, but no screaming is happening and screaming should be happening. That's the situation we live in. And luckily we still have the trees, we still have the trees out here. We have a gorgeous cloud particles above us and we live as if that's the life, but that's not the only life. The way we are boiling it away and killing it and the way we allow our our, our super bosses to regulate our life into submission to these destructive forces is so ununderstandable and nonsensical. So we are all educated intelligently and we also act stupidly by not acting upon all this sufficiently. But the sufficiency is hard to come by. What is it? sufficiently. Screaming all day long, you get hoarse. Yeah. And what to scream and how to bring it across. Yeah. Ah. We do one show that's called the Praise and Denunciation Show. And it consists of five praises and five denunciations. And the uh, praises are all dances of the jolly dandelions that grow all over here. I don't know if you know them, but they're the gorgeous mm -hmm. little uh, yellow golden flowers that become puste bloom. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, they're wonderful. And they're all over their place and they sort of dip the whole field into a a golden glory and just too much to take in. And the denunciations are the obvious ones of what we read in the paper and what we see there. The total incompetence of how to deal with this. Look at this richest country in the world. Richest country in the world. Doesn't know how to deal with these things. There were tiny countries that know very well how to alert the, their population, how to protect them, how to do it. And, and these billionaire idiots that run the show here, no idea, no capacity of understanding or of sensing the suffering that their idiocy creates. Unbelievable that this is happening in a so-called civilized country.
or maybe over civilized country. Yeah. Yeah, my God, what a world. Hmm? Mm. And you're in New York City right now, are yeah. you? Oh yeah. my God. Oh, <laughs> we lived for nine years in New York City on the yeah. Lower East Side. The Lancy Street, right? On, yeah, the, our loft was on the Lancy Street. But we lived first on East 4th Street in a building, yeah, it was five flights up, I think. And no elevator, no nothing. And we had our kids up there. And oh my God, was that interest. And about once a week, a robber came climbing through the fire escape and emptied out our fridge. <laughs> and that was a very regular occurrence. <laughs> And I was stupid enough one time to follow that guy, I was just a kid, over the rooftops and then jump and jump. But neither me nor him fell so lucky. <laughs> lucky, lucky you. Yeah, no, you have been in such a such a such a presence. You, your work is admired um, around the world. What you invented, these kind of uh, the Benkel singing, the the songs, uh, the kind of Brechtian. Uh, the declamatorial, uh, political singing, uh, the puppet work, um, the work in streets and places. We talk to so many artists, whether it is Emilio Rao in Ghent, or it is people in Lebanon, or people in Taiwan, people in uh, Brazil, and they all say, we have now, we have to get out of the theaters, we have to get out of the of, of these buildings. Uh, not only we can't perform there because of regulation, but also perhaps it's time to go out. You have done that for such a long time time what works what did you find what methods what do you feel really works and something to tell to our listeners who often are theater artists well i guess it depends on the circumstances when we and on the cops also when we started in new york in the street in 62 the cops hadn't seen any street theater there wasn't any day because they didn't remember that during the labor, uh, the early in the 20s, there was already something like that, that, that had died away. And so the cops are too young, they didn't know this. And we had to have our shows all, well, it was easy, it was just me and usually a friend, a Puerto Rican friend who could translate things into Spanish and to, it always had to be lightweight. So when the cop started moving the wrong way that we could just move. And but it was all this technique of being quick on your feet, being ready to leave, uh, avoid confrontations. And it, well, it worked for a bunch of years. But the, what you say, well, our things were done on the first ones were paper scrolls that we called crankies, sort of an imitation of what a movie does. You paint on the paper scroll, which you find lying around uh, outside of newspaper printing places. They throw them out and you pick them up and draw your story on there. You crank it in a box and uh, you tell the story along with that. They were mostly about cops, rats, uh, horrible murders resulting from either or angels for salvation purposes and so forth. Yeah. Mm. That's how it started. But then, the, in addition to the neighborhood, the overwhelming powers from Vietnam were the next, was just too hard to take to listen to all that stuff and to not do it. And then in New York, the situation was that a lot of the casualties were Puerto Rican who couldn't even vote, but they were used as cannon fodder in the Vietnam War. And there was an organization of Puerto Rican women who had all got the same letter that starts with the words, we regret to inform you. And they asked us if we could do 
a play for them, and we did. And that was the play we played more than we, any play we ever played. It's a tiny little street show for five people, very easy to do, very lightweight, just a few masks, a drum, a, a bugle, and, and that's it, and a few performers. Yeah, and it was about that letter we regret to, ref to inform you. Yeah. Mm. yeah, these were theaters that worked, that reached audiences. You said you had an interpreter, so you always translated your shows into... Not stuff. always, but on the Lower East Side, on the, between Avenue D and B, those blocks were mostly Spanish speaking. There were other blocks that were more Ukrainian and Russian, but the blocks where we lived, where there was a lot of Spanish. And if you played in the street, yeah, it felt you needed Spanish translation. And it's so, yeah. so incredibly um, um, forward thinking to make theater that it also can be understood by the people there for whom you make it to have languages you hear on the street, also on the show a participation in that way um, and to create um, um, a meaningful uh, work of theater, work of art, um, actually for the people who are most, um, who are most uh, affected uh, uh, by it. That was the great Jean-Claude van Italy show at La Mama, America Rap, but I'm sure it was not, not and he did great work and I like him very much and also his upstate uh, uh, Shangri-La estate, but you were on the street in different languages where you could run away from the cops and then slowly you brought in larger puppets and uh, and um, and so I think uh, really your 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 way of working um, is so, so so significant. You also mention often your avant you were influenced by the avant garde by John John Cage, Merce Cunningham, um, Fluxus. How did you see your work connected to that movement? Well, uh, when when I I had a little dance company in the late fifties in. You were a dancer, Munich, right? Outside of Munich in Germany. And when I when we had that dance company, we saw Cunningham perform in Munich. And I met Cunningham and Cage. And then when we came to New York, I vis visited Cunningham's studio. And in that studio, he uh, conducted evening classes together with a person called Robert Dunn, who used interpretations of John Cage's book, Silence, as material for dance choreographers. And these were all the dance choreographers who later on uh, got a big name, Yvonne Reiner, Simone Morris, Robert Morris, uh, Trisha Brown, they, they, they were all in that workshop. But their work was confined to this small circle of uh, intellectual firebrands and innovators. It didn't extend it was an inspiration for me to abandon that, frankly, to go in the street and do in the street where the majority were either Puerto Ricans or Hasidic Jews or Ukrainians in, in the majority. So for me to abandon that was just as important as to be inside it. And the Abandoning wasn't just the little cranky movies, but it also linked itself with the War Resisters League, with the Greenwich Village Peace Center, which was just created at that time. And those were all things that uh, afforded us to be big to get many, many people into shows. So we built the puppets bigger and bigger made the noises louder and louder so that it would work in the street, had big drum choruses of dozens of drums, 
and use puppets first six, seven, eight, and 10 feet tall and use them in the parades. And we found out that we got people to participate very easily, that they were sick and tired of just holding up their slogans on a stick and rather joined in on a big chorus of, of gray lady puppets or whatever we used at the time and to be part of a more total picture, a performance where an airplane would fly overhead and mow down the Vietnamese. And that's what pull them up and the airplane would come back and mow them down and other forces would pull them up, etc. Continuous performance down Fifth Avenue. Those were possibilities given by the moment, really. They went, we didn't have to invent them. They just had to be the reaction that was possible to do to the horrors that existed. So it was massive and it worked to that degree, didn't stop the war. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but it's some of the strongest memories of many, you know, of theater have been your, your work, your shows, and it uh, resonated with them, confirmed the belief in something, the fact that you were doing as a symbolic imaginary art made it real. Um, you write also, you said, the way how your company is organized is a form of art that you are self-govern, that it's an, an autark structure, that you do not depend on city funding or others. Tell us a little bit, what, what do you say when you say this is an art form? Well, the normality of art production as we saw mostly in the city relied on systems that existed, like for painters, the gallery system. Okay, well, the gallery in that system only accepts what is running as the fashion and the accepted style of painting, but not the opposite of that. <laughs> and the same is true of poetry magazines or of music makings or of puppetry or of theater that these uh, these halls of traditional uh, communication to the public have their restrictions. And in order to do the art you need to do, you got to first destroy that hall there. You got to step out of it or climb on top of it or reinvent it or not use it. There, there are all these alternative things that you learn from, yeah, mostly from not having money. It's as simple as that. So when you don't have money, you just invent something that you make from garbage. And we didn't want to rely on money raising, on sitting at a telephone or at a typewriter and asking for money all these applications for being part of the economy as it were. We want it to be opposite the economy. So and the opposite means you have to learn, you have to eat, learn, you discipline your eating, you discipline your uses, you, you pick the garbage as good as you can and make your things from the garbage. And, and you, you can make big things by just utilizing the garbage. And, that was being, became like a, an attraction for the youngsters who come every year to help us make the circuses because they are brought up in the American or European tradition of that art is a soloistic, you do it and you develop your this and that and style and you and so on. And it's not, it's a communal enterprise art. It's something where you 
talk not only with your wife or your friend, but with your enemies as well, and with younger ones and older ones, and you make something, you pick your theme that way, and then you make your things that way. And it's, it's, it, it's the opposite of an uh, individualistic enterprise. It's, its speech is collective. Even its speech is something that's composed of elements that consist of many people's speeches. So that was what we wanted to bring across to the many kids who came every year to be here, to be in the countryside and to do circusing. Yeah. Yeah. Circus. Circus. <laughs> so, so, so such a significant, important art form we had um, also um, circus artists with us. But also I would like to point out earlier on that your idea of audience participation, which was a real participation and not making fun of it or including someone but back about you know what often done or you know you're used as a prop whatever no you said come hold a puppet be part of that movement show something and that way when you do something in an action perhaps you know um, 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 is something different than as you said just shouting a slogan or holding up a poster you really do something and call to action that as Brecht said it's no longer good enough to portray the world as it is, you know, we have to change it and we have to take now, perhaps our theater has to, has to um, take action. I don't know, I, we talked about it earlier, I think your uh, White Cheap Art Manifesto, is this one of the great pieces of writing in the 20, 20th century, one of the great manifests of any artist in any time, in any century. And uh, you, you, you wrote this, I think. And if, do you have it or should I read, do you have, do you have it with you? Um, why don't you read it? <laughs> I have, yeah. So I, I want our audience really to 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 listen um, to that. It was done in '84, and it said, um, "The Why Cheap Art what is it? Manifesto." <clears throat> People have been thinking too long that art is a privilege of the museums and the rich. Art is not business. It does not belong to banks and fancy investors. Art is food. You can eat it, but it feeds you. Art has to be cheap and available to everybody. It needs to be everywhere because it is inside the world. Art soothes this pain. Art wakes up sleepers. Art fights against war and stupidity. Art sings hallelujah. Art is for kitchens. Art is like good bread. Art is like green trees. Art is like white clouds in the blue sky. Art is cheap. Hurrah, bread and puppet in Global Vermont 84. Tell us a little bit about this manifesto. Well, the, I think I wrote this in reaction to some big full page ads in the New York Times that proclaimed art as being good for business, like Exxon and I forget which other companies mm -hmm. uh, published these big pages with big slogans of how wonderful art is for business because it can decorate their sales and what have you. And I wanted to say that this is exactly the opposite of what art is. And art is not a piece of advertisement for a money maker but art is the thing that's inside you and it comes outside. So it was relatively easy to oppose that relatively stupid advertising page. And I made a lot of those and later on, when I met Hans Hake, who's also mm -hmm. German and also lived in New York. What a great exhibition just last year, yeah. Yeah, and he, he saw the same pages and had the same reaction to it and also made a series of not manifestos, but of artworks that dealt with these silly commercial slogans. But what I, what I say in here and isn't stressed enough is the fact that we are called the bread and puppet theater, not the puppet and bread theater. 
for us, the bread that we distribute to the audience at each show and that we bake ourselves is that's the fundament of our art that this real reality of eating and not eating as a solo act but eating as a communal act with each other and in order to make it a little harder for people we smear a very strong garlic sauce on it that is called aioli that we learned in the Provence in France. And it's, um, yeah, and it, it tips them up and makes them <laughs> jump up. And yeah, we have big ovens. We grind our own rye. We grow our own rye now. We, I learned the bread baking from my mother in Silesia. So the bread we make is Silesian rye bread, sourdough rye bread. And we, when we were refugees, all the grain was what we, the kids, could glean off the, the fields. And we had a little coffee mill and was ground in there and the sourdough was made and the bread was baked in a communal oven, which the village had, where once in a week, the baker was the fire maker. He made the fire, the villagers came with their loaves, each loaf had a different sign on it for each family. And the baker baked them and people went home and ate them and next week, the same thing. And we have a big oven, the same size as that village oven was so that when we had 20 or 30,000 people, they could all get bread. So we baked five, six time, uh, I don't know, 50 to 70 loaves in there. And yeah, no problem. Baking and distributing bread was our start of how we wanted to do theater, eating theater, chewing theater. This is uh, quite some, and part of your family continues the tradition. I know your daughter is so married to um, to uh, Sebastian Brecht, who makes chocolate. You know, Brecht's uh, grandson, who has that fantastic <laughs> chocolate store. The opposite store. of bread. <laughs> yes, the opposite of bread, but fantastic <laughs> one. But still, um, it's uh, we also are in in different times. But Peter, what this time of Corona, where? Um, you know, already said you do your painting now, but you can't do your work. You're not in contact with 70, 80 people where you, you know, as a catalyst. Oh, it's difficult. Together. No, I know. What do you, what do you, how, how does that have an impact on you? Does it change you? What do you think about? What do you dream about in the night? Yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It has to be, everything has to be reconsidered. Every aspect of it. And I don't know, my first reaction was to put free bread on a table outside our museum, to make a table with bread on it. And then I made little paper puppets from a twig of pine with a little paper face. And I put signs out saying, bread, uh, and I gave it an adjective, I called it immune system boosting bread, and uh, virus fighting clown puppets, help yourselves. And people come and they put a little money in the hat that's there, and they help themselves have the bread in a box, and the puppets right next to them. And I also bring loaves of bread to two local stores, to the local store in Glover, a common store, and <coughs> to a co-op store in the village a little further away. And I bake as much as I can. We still have rye left. So I keep grinding and baking. And I'm now at the moment I'm baking tiny little one pound pumpernickels that are relatively easy to bake in a form 
that takes to bake 40 or 50 of them takes one bucket of pine wood. That's all that heats the oven. And then the pump and nickel stays in there for 12 hours and bakes at slow temperature for a long time. And that's a bread that keeps. It's not like your normal bread that goes stale. It doesn't. You can keep it for a month, for two months. It will still be good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's one aspect of uh, trying to react to it. How to solve all the other aspects, namely the many friends who have come over the years and who are living in Boston or in New York or wherever and who want to be part of this and have been part of it for so long. But how to overcome the complication of their coming, quarantining for a week, getting a test done, then being able to be close to people, how to cook for them, how to have them use the outhouses. All these problems are overwhelming. It's big. So we are working on it. We have no solution. We are, we are just going piece by piece. We are doing small shows now and we want to build them up. Yeah, I have no good answers for what this will come to. We hope to get circuses with enough locals coming to participate in a careful way by mid-July. So that's the goal. Hmm. And what do you do for inspiration? What I mean, I think Ria from the Paper Moon Puppet Theater Company in Indonesia said that, you know, to keep the motor warm, we have to do something. What, what do, you, do, you read, <laughs> do you read or what do you uh, listen to music? Or do you write a yeah, diary? I to um, yeah, what, what do you I do? Write, yeah. If I have time, I do a little reading. We read, my wife and I read quite a bit of Emily Dickinson together mm -hmm. in the evenings. So you read or, it to each other? Uh, yeah, or I read her a piece of Jakob Böhme, Aurora, or I read her a little, she speaks German as well. So I can read Mörike, mm -hmm. I can read Goethe, I, we can even read Hölderlin together. So we are, yeah, naturally Brecht and others, yes. We have the, uh, the, the fortune to have our two languages. And there's a lot of literature available, as you know. Mm -hmm. But we are especially fond of Emily Dickinson as a treat before we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, who also lived, you know, in her have house and uh, uh, in Amherst and a uh, bit removed uh, from it. So um, do you um, think about work? Let's say there is a vaccine is found um, and um, mm -hmm. a very promising one, as they say, just in Germany started last week. Um, and other, but uh, if you redo theater, let's say next year or whatever it might be, will there be Will you be something different than what you did before, or do you will it be an adaptation, a mutation, or do you think for us we have always done the right thing? We're going to do it an even better, more. No, we, what, no, will, no, we, what will happen? Uh, <coughs> we, we we can't be defined as having found out how to do theater. We haven't. What we do is extremely unfinished. What we do is fragmentary. It's a piece of a larger thing that we haven't succeeded to do. It's always like that. It's something that when we started off, it's a big concept. And then what we do is a couple of fragments that contribute to that. But the finishing has never happened. So for us, finishing is somewhere, uh, I don't know, way out there somewhere. It's. Uh, suddenly not achieved or reached. It's like music, you know, the, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, for me, these radicals, that's the, the, the 
the Schoenberg School, Weber, and Schoenberg. That was an eye opener. It was fantastic. I mean, I was brought up with the classics, and I loved my Bach and my Mozart and what have you. But then to hear this radical turnaround, this totally revolutionary anti-bourgeois taste, this totally aggressive sound, this totally uncompromising aesthetic that didn't bend to a popular conception of pleasingness and so on. That was a fantastic eye-opener. And I was so sorry to see it being taken away by the minimalists and the, and the other later fashions of modern music. And it wasn't there, but in our company, we still work with that kind of sounds in addition to doing traditional brass music and Scottish dance music and such things. So we have youngsters who are totally into 12 and 13 tone uh, radicalizing of music. And that will continue. And it's unfinished, as I mm. pointed out. It's, it's not a thing where we say, we have it, we know how to do it. No, we don't. But we are continuing to look for that, to do our searching. Yeah. And this is so, it's, it, in a way, it has always been like this, a moment of questioning what you are doing and reinventing it and trying to present fragments of, of the possibility. Mm -hmm. um, what, what art did you see? What theater or maybe music other, but what, what did, what in, since we are about theater, what did you see? What masters or what theater works influenced you where you say, this is something I, uh, I, that moved me, what in your long work in theater, what mm -hmm. are your point of reference, or what influenced yeah, you? Right, it's, it's hard to wrap that up. But uh, recently a friend told me <coughs> about a piece by Irene Fornes, and I, the Cuban playwright, and one of my strongest memories of New York City theater was a piece by Irene done in the, in, the, in the yard, not in Judson Church, but in the yard behind Judson Church, which opens to, uh, not Thompson Street, to the others, maybe Bleecker could be, with a big metal gate. And in the, it, it was a piece that was based on Rilke's poem, Annunciation. And, the, <laughs> and Al Carmines was a pianist and he was very gifted to do speaking lines while playing piano in a totally different beat. He could do that. And I believe it was a Bach fugue that he used and he did do the speaking lines with it. And, a, and Eileen Paslov, the dancer, opened the big gate. And I also believe, I think that's true, her father was a feather merchant and had helped her to make a giant pair of wings from polychrome feathers. And she had these wings and she came, a light was shining on her as she came through that big metal gate, which closed behind her again. And then instead of flying onto the little stage where the, the Mary who was in, expecting the angel was sitting, she just went to the audience and showed off the beautiful feathers and went around and and people stroked her feathers and admired them. And only then did she become an angel and went to Mary. And oh, it was such a gorgeous piece, unforgettable. And, you know, a radical theater done on very traditional, with uh, use of very traditionalistic means, like marvelous costuming. Uh, the, the, Bach piano, I think it was even a clavichord that he played. And, and then, oh, yeah, 
the colors and the, the light, the way it was used. And so, so super simple and concentrated on very few gestures. The dressing of Joseph was one of them, just dressing a person to be an actor, to be made, to be appropriate for performing the role of Joseph and so on. Yeah, mm. wonderful. <laughs> okay, anyway, that was an example of an yeah, but New York was so full of interesting things. In 61, our, the super of our building was a man who called himself the Uranian ambassador. He thought of himself as being an ambassador to the planet Uranus. And he had a club of friends who smoked a lot of dope together and did music together. And they had gotten the loft of Judson Church to do weekly meetings. And those Uranian philanthropists, he called them. And th this was my first company to work with. I tried to get... <coughs> these attendees in the Cunningham studio to do dances with me. And I, but I didn't have a telephone at that time. It was too complicated to ever meet anybody. And Dickie Tyler and his, these neighborhood kind of dopey friends, they were very willing. And we did a dance for the War Resisters League uh, general strike for peace, uh, living theater and war resistance league, end of 61, 62, pronounced a general strike for peace. The, the general wasn't very general because it was for a couple of hundred people, but it was an, an, an attempt to start a movement against atomic war mongering. England had that movement already and the US didn't have it. And the Living Seattle and the War Resistance League wanted to instill it in there. So I made that dance, a dance of death, which uh, a mass dance, which I had done in Munich and otherwise in Germany before I came to the States. And I did a ver another version with these Uranian alchemy players uh, in, in the Judson Church. Yeah, that was my first production in the thing, but it totally relied on this group of music makers that were available to me because of our, the super of our building, Dickie Tyler. Mm -hmm who was a great artist, a great woodcarver. <clears throat> he had a push cart where he took his woodcuts, little chapbooks and single, what did he call the single sheets? He had a name for this. But anyway, he took them out because he was a war veteran. He was allowed to sell things in the street. <clears throat> and he had a push cart that Judson allowed him to park in their backyard. And on weekends, he would go out into Washington Square into this area and try to sell his cuts for a quarter, a nickel, a dime, and so forth. Mm. Yeah, it's a great, great, great lesson how to make art. You know, you ask the people you know, you have the places that are available but you need a cause, you know, the one that you had, you know, the, the strike for peace. Peter, why do you think we need art? Why is art important? Oh my God. <gasps> Mama mia, now I have to start thinking. <laughs> Alice, God, can you answer it? I why can't do we need hear anything. <laughs> oh, 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 why do we need art? Uh, 
The bread is easier to answer, right? Yeah, why do we need bread, good bread? But with the bread, it was, for us, it was an eye-opener to do German bread in America. The bread was so terrible in New York. We didn't want to eat it, so we had to make our own bread. And I mean, America was overwhelmed by, what's it called, Wonder Bread? This is sort of like a white fluffy thing that is squished together. It's when you squish it together, it's a whole loaf is about this big. And then you can toss it at your, that's what students do in cafeterias. They push it together, throw it at somebody, mm -hmm. <laughs> send them a message. Yeah, why art? My God. The why art question. I don't know if it is a question. It exists. It accompanies the human marching on, whatever that marching on is. It tries to channel it, but it seldom succeeds. It, it tries to influence it to a certain degree, maybe. And it tries to stop wars. I don't quite see how it could or how it does. It tries to change the foolishness that the general direction of civilization has taken with something that's more related to what should be, namely Mother Earth and what's, what we have as a life with our neighbors, the sparrows or the pigeons or whoever they are. And it does all that because it needs to be, there needs to be other responses than the jargons that we have invent, invented that call themselves communication, but communicate not enough, don't have the intensity that communication would have if it would be real communication. So we have delegated that away from us to and call it poetry or philosophy, but in actuality, that's our real speech. That's our real communication. And the other one, the pragmatic one, is the doubtful one that should be junked, overhauled. Yeah, it's not a good answer, but... It's a very good one. But I can't think of other ones. Yeah. All right. My God. Art is cheap, yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> but I should like to, Kautzka, can I introduce you? Your I have no idea what's going the, my, on. This is my censor and, and editor, <laughs> supervisor. Publisher? For many years, yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know if she's on the picture there. Or yes, she is. Yes, yeah, she yeah. is. Good, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we are doing this together for over 65 years now. So, yeah, it's going on and on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Where is it going to go, all of this? We don't know that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I thought it was going to be an hour long. I go long. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Patience. Mm -hmm. Frank, what else? Yeah. What do you want what to else? Know? Well, um, you have said so many profound things. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> you have said so many, many things, as you know, and, and maybe we could also come back one day. Maybe, yeah, so to come um, um, to, to a conclusion in a way, is, and uh, we are over the hour, as Elke said. Yeah, um, good. Um, for young 
CETA artists now, whether they may be in New York, like you were on the Lancy Street one day, or whether they listen to us from South America or Asia or Africa, your work is so well known around the world. So many companies have you name you as an inspiration for their work. It's just uh, mm. tremendous, one of the most influential theater okay, movements. Yeah, um, and um, <laughs> what, what, uh, what what advice do you have for these young artists uh, or artists in general to say to how to use this time we are in now and what is meaningful to think about how what should they do well the the i think the advice is in the details of the uh, situation where you're in how are you confined if you're in a single room if you if you're confined to not seeing anybody being on well then you have to invent art that is blind that is non outlooking that is independent of these visits that you normally get if you're already able to go through the door to meet other people that's another piece of art so then you have to follow that and see what that one does if it's even further if you can have a group of friends that quarantine together with you, then you have that greater possibility. I think we have to stick to the advice we get on the carefulness of our behavior. And we have to invent our art according to this advice, with that advice in mind. We can't do it against it. It has to be with that in mind. The government is doing the against it. And that is so apparently stupid and irresponsible. It's so clear that we can all learn from that. That's the way how not to do it. To just say, oh, we need an economy and we need money making, no bullshit, no. We need bodies, we need health, we need kids, we need grandparents. That's what we need. We don't need an economy. Economy, by economy, they mean billionaires. That's what they mean. To, to make the rich richer. That's what they mean. And that's what they do when they get the taxpayers trillions of dollars and distribute them, they go to their billionaire friends. And then the little crumbs go to the little businesses. No, it's a totally unjustifiably horrendous, devilish system, this capitalistic mode of this late stage of this collapsing system that obviously can't survive. So, yep, yep, kick, push, fight, speak, stand on your head, scream, break the window, fix the window. Ah. Well, Peter, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's thank really, you for um, that's really, really is uh, uh, a great advice next to so many other things to break the window, but also fix, fix the window. That's uh, the windows we look out uh, now and we are forced to look out. And you, of course, are up there in Vermont. You made a decision a long time ago, which now looks like a very important one, you know, that perhaps, uh, as some people say, it might be the end of the very, very big cities where everybody wants to go, the people will have a second thought now, you know, where to live, how to live their lives, what is essential and um, what is important. Peter, you gave us uh, so much and Elke, thanks for being there. Thank you for um, uh, getting on Zoom and uh, preparing and uh, talking to us. This is very, very important. Uh, uh, you are a pioneer. As they say, the pioneers are the ones who sometimes get the arrows in the back, but still they are the pioneers. So you did uh, work theater that was uh, going to towards the future, uh, anticipating the future and what you found and the way you make theater um, is going to work also now and in the coming months and years um, of this Corona time. So it should be studied, should be looked at, seriously considered as of significance and importance and congratulations on everything you did, the way of life, the way you work together, the both you guys are together, your farm, the community you created, um, what a great life if there ever is a sainthood in theater uh, for the gods of theater you will be in there and um 
And uh, but I know you also did, started you did so many, over. yeah, you all did so you many saints. passion plays. <laughs> I remember the passion plays of the Latin American people, what you created for. I know the beautiful thing you did for Judith Molina after she left us. So really, thank you, thank you, and thank you for sharing. And our listeners, wow. hopefully you will be with us this week when we have a uh, uh, Govan Rubin and Terence Conrad from Malaysia will be with us tomorrow and tell about uh, the situation there. But also from Australia, the great Tanya Bruguera and the way she did, who is getting in and out of prisons also for her work. And she's in Cuba now. And it's a very difficult circumstances in her work. And her work has been so um, significant. And, you know, not only at the Tate Gallery, but also the center she created in New York City. Hope Azeda from Rwanda. In Africa, we'll talk about her life and work there, and Saman Amini about being an immigrant artist from Iran in, in the Netherlands. So really, uh, again, thank you both. Thank you to our listeners for taking, again, some time out of your life. Yeah. I know how much is out there, and it's getting more and more, but it means a lot to us. And our artists really do need to be heard. As we heard today, they really have something to say. It's of importance. It's significant. Artists have been on the right side of history. They have been on the right side on the complex struggle for freedom and liberties. And we listen to them and we should listen to them. And a lot of evil and suffering in the world could have been prevented if their voices could be heard in any society where artists are in the center and closer is a good one, is a great one. It's a measurement of uh, what uh, human civilization can and should be all about. So thank you, thanks for HowlRound, Thea, and Travis, Greetings for hosting to us. all of you. Yeah, and, and good luck Andy and stay and healthy Anya. and careful. Thank you, Peter. And I'm going to come and visit you soon and uh, oh, okay. keep good painting. And thank yeah, you for, um, for being with us and um, and uh, taking you away from painting and baking bread and thinking about your auto performances. <laughs> but um, to everybody, if you haven't seen some of their work, if you haven't been there, please do go whenever it's possible again. It's a, a brilliant, and again, he is a living uh, treasure, a living legend. And um, thank you for sharing your time, Peter. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.